Hello again. We're all together co-authors in the story of a new, seemingly boundless institution, Icon S. And the latest chapter is being written today, in these days, and we are led through the writing of this new chapter by Albert Chen and Cora Chan, Dean Michael Hoare, our hosts here at Hong Kong University. So please join me in thanking them once again for all they've done to welcome us here. It's my privilege to chair the second plenary panel on the subject of courts and democracy. I will not introduce, at least not in an in-depth way, each of the panelists. I'll invite you to refer to the program that you have in your hands. But I will tell you the order in which the panelists will be speaking. Our first speaker will be Justice Ilwon Kang of the Constitutional Court of Korea, whose speech is addressed entitled, The Role of the Constitutional Court in Korea's Democratization. He'll be followed by Professor Kim Lane Shepley, who will address us with the speech entitled, How Populists Kill Judicial Independence. And finally, Professor Ling Suzi will address us on the subject of after democratization, the Taiwan Constitutional Court at the crossroads of judicial activism. Professor Ling joins us from the Academica Sinica in Taipei. Let me now yield the floor to our first speaker, Justice Kang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I start my presentation, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the ICONS and the University of Hong Kong for this wonderful conference and having me here. I think it is my duty as a fourth speaker of this plenary session. Yesterday, at the fourth plenary session, we talked about diversity, identity, and human rights. And there, we we have kinds of con, uh, con, con, consensus that the di too, we should accept the diversity and we, have, we should keep the constitutional identity and protect human rights. Then, who, who, are respons who has the responsibility to keep the constitutional identity and protect human rights? In before World War II, I, heard, I, I know there was a, a dispute between these matters. Hans Kelsen, who is a theorist about the pure theory of law, uh, asserted that the judiciary uh, must, have a, ha, must protect these kinds of, have these kinds of job. His, his assertion is the only the judiciary has a, uh, the kinds of independent judiciary has, can uh, to protect human rights and keep the constitutional identity. But at the time, uh, uh, Karl Schmitt, the German scholar, uh, do not, did not accept his theory. He asserted uh, the court has least uh, kinds of democratic legitimacy than the parliament or the president who was who elected by the direct election from the people who has sovereignty. So uh, only the Austria, which, who, which is the native of Hans Kelsen, and the Czechoslovakia accepted the theory of Hans Kelsen, and they established the constitutional court for the first time in the world. It is 1920. So they will celebrate 100th anniversary next in 2012. But after the World War II, many Europeans acknowledged the need of the constitutional court and constitutional justice. So they began to accept the theory of Hans Kelsen. And nowadays, almost all countries have a constitutional court or the Supreme Court, which will doing their job as a constitutional justice. 
It is not an exception in Korea. We have a constitutional court, and we are now enjoying the full democracy. And I'm a judge of the constitutional court, but not only myself, but many Koreans agreed the role of the constitutional court was very crucial to in make our country so democratic as of now. I explained the, our history and what was the reason and the strength that makes our court do this job. But unfortunately, because of uh, our, I have only 15 or 20 minutes, so I can't explain details, so I'll make it very brief, and I'll delightfully to answer any questions after this session. How can I check this? Enter? Oh, yes. I'll begin with the second page. As you know, the Korea is the first country which became a donor country from the recipient in ODA. The other country is, is, it is the world first, and no country is following not yet. Also, the Korea is the first country which turned from the dictatorship to full democracy. And it is based on the, the people's will. I mean, uh, it, begins, it began with the end of the World War II. The Korean remained absolute monarchy until the annexation of Japan in 1910. Until then, we are under the old, old kingdom. And during the Japanese colony for 35 years, we, we Koreans didn't have any experience in democracy. But fortunately, after World War II, the South Korea was governed by the United States military. So we experienced three years of U.S. military government, and during the time, we learned a lot about U.S.-style democracy. But unfortunately, the North Korea, they, North Korean people, they did not have any chance to learn or experience democracy. So nowadays, North and South has a big difference. North Korea, North Korean regime can keep their country so closed and so autocratic because the people of North Korea never experienced a democracy. But the South Korean people learned and experienced a democracy for three years by the U.S. government, and they learned a lot about the democratic theory. So when the Republic, was, Republic of Korea was established in 1948, the President Lee He's a doctor of the Princeton University, and he is well known to the, the American style democracy. But he thought because of the, our kinds of chaos in after the World War II, he maintained the kinds of author, author, authoritarian regime as a civil dictators. It is deepened after the war, Korean War. We suffered three years of the Korean War. But, as I said, people learned the democracy. And in 1960s, many students went to the street to ask the democracy. And some students were killed by the police. And this, but these kinds of street demonstration by the students was supported by the whole people. And President Lee accepted the need asking of the people and resigned. And we have a new parliamentary system after this student revolution. But unfortunately, just one year of short our own democracy, then we faced the military coup d'etat in 1961. But with the experience of this success of a student revolution, these kinds of blood is, is going on, on on our Koreans' blood. So these, the students who, were, who succeeded in the student revolution became a leader of our society in 1980s. 
So in 1987, the Korean people protest, make a mass protest to the military dictatorship, and we finally uh, get a new constitution, which is very democratic. And at that time, the constitutional court was established. But constitutional court is not a newborn for the Koreans. Actually, uh, we have a constitutional adjudication since 1948. It is a, a very early adopter of the constitutional justice compared to the whole world. As I said, only Austria and Czechoslovakia has had a constitutional court before the World War II. I don't mention the United States, it is an exception. And in 1948, there is a very little, very a few countries have these kinds of constitutional adjudication system. But in 1948, we have a constitutional committee and we have a constitutional court after the student revolution in 1960. And after the military coup d'etat by the president ex-President Park, we have the American Self-Judicial Review System. It maintained until 10 years. But the leaders, the, re the leaders of the region found this kind of constitutional justice is very inconvenient for their regime. Be on, although the judges of the Supreme Court or the members of the Constitutional Committee was strongly controlled by the regime, but still they are lawyers and they are uh, law students. They were law students. So they sometimes, they were very so strong, so brave to break down the critical rule of the authoritarian regime. So in 1972, the military regime change the constitutional court and made the constitutional committee again and make the process very hard to reach this committee. So for 15 years, we had no constitutional justice cases for 15 years. It is uh, one reason to make the people go out in 1987. So as a result of, as I said, the result of the, the civil protest in 1987, Finally, we have the Constitutional Court of Korea, which is, will, will be 30 years old this year. Once this court is established, the main job is the liquidation of the authoritarian rule. As you, as you read in this screen, we handled more than 33,000 cases for 30 years and more than 1% of full bench cases com in cases, complainants won. It means we made a huge amount of statutes null and void. It is, uh, I do not know the exact situation of the other countries, but I heard it is maybe the world first. <laughs> it is not a good uh, record, but uh, we did a lot of job to get rid of the authoritarian kinds of tradition in Korean, Korea. At first, stage, at first stage in 1990s, the major effort of our court went into remedying many statutes, which had accumulated over many years under the authoritarian regime, and this constitutionality was relatively easy to judge because during military rule and the dictatorship, th they made many statutes which is unconstitutional, but only convenient for the regime. So the court struck, struck down many unconstitutional laws, such as National Security Act and Criminal Procedure Code, which is more, more non-balanced, more power public prosecutors than defendants. And the, I want to mention the, especially this act, this case, the Motion Pictures Act case. It is decided in 1996, 
according to the motion picture set or movies or all dramas must be uh, must get inspection from the ethics commission by the government it means it is kind of uh, censorship but censorship is banned by the constitution so it is it is it is very eminent that it is unconstitutional but it survived until 1996 and the, finally the court found this act unconstitutional it makes the in it makes the korea very differently nowadays after this our judgment finally the the movie movie company and many drama company began to work very uh, kinds of creatively also many uh, dramas k-pop so uh, as you as you may know some of you know the k-pop it is they said it is uh, they uh, re they have credit to our court in 1996 with 10 years of these kinds of job then in 2000 we can say it is the second stage of our court. Then we have now the court are began to dealing with more detailed and more sophisticated matters in human rights. For example, Telecommunications Business Act. According to this act, the government banned the people to uh, make any sentence in the internet without uh, reveal his real name. It is a big difference to make people to reveal his real name in the internet. So uh, the government make it kinds of barrier to make opinion clear on the internet. The, the Constitutional Court of Korea found it is unconstitutional. It is uh, against the freedom of expression. It makes a, it, ch it made a change the Korean internet culture and also it influenced the free free circulation of information and it makes the candlelight revolution possible in 2016 and it, it relates to the presidential impeachment in 2016 I'll talk about it later also in this period we the court uh, strike down many civil codes which is uh, very unequal to women, such as uh, when the family gets a child, the child must follow the family name of father. The, the child cannot, could not get the name of her, his or her mother. It is banned in the civil code. This code was found unconstitutional, and nowadays, mother, the children can get the f family name of his or her mother. Also, there is the family registry, registry system. It is only for the, it designated only a son as a head of the family. The daughter can, could not be a head of family. These kinds of uh, codes found unconstitutional. And finally, after the uh, 2010s, the recently, uh, as the court did uh, these kinds of job, finally the people have trust to our court and they gave any kinds of conflict to our court. So nowadays we are dealing with many cases which we are, have in common in the world. For example, prohibition on sex trafficking and vote, voting rights of prisoners, etc. And with this effort and with this, our, our decisions, finally, the, we are enjoying, the, the Constitutional Court of Korea are enjoying the best majority of people's trust. Korean court is uh, 
has been nominated as the most trusted government institution for about 10 years. So it relates to the presidential impeachment in two years ago. Before we impeached the, the president in 2016, we had another case in 2004. At the time, the president, No Moo-hyun, made of expressing his support for a ruling party. But this kind of act w was banned in that time because of the duty of neutrality of the government official. And the, the opposition party argued the president violates the law. According to our constitution, whenever the president violates the constitu constitution or the law, he, can, he or she can be impeached. So the opposition impeached the present law, but the, at the time, the constitutional court found, yes, the president law in, violates the law, but the violation is not so grave to impeach the president himself because president's job is so important. So to impeach the president, the violation must be enoughly grave to impeach him. It is this kind of pro pro proportionality analysis. It is, uh, it can, we, so someone can say it is kind of just a political kinds of drama, but in make a, in made a good precedent. So in 2016, the ex-president Park abused the power for the benefit of a secret friend. Then we can use these 2004 cases as a pre precedent. So we found the violation of the President Park's abuse of power is enough grave to impeach her. It is, uh, it, it make a very big effect on Korean society because with this decision, people finally found the president who, had, who has uh, so great power can be impeached under the constitution with the decision of the court. Also, this is possible because of the people's demand during the candlelight streets revolution in 2015 and 2016. So many Koreans now realize the importance of the constitution and constitutional justice. As a wrap up, I want to emphasize this one. As I said, Korea is the first country which, which became the re recipient of the ODA to the donors. And I was born in 1959, and at that time, Korea was the poorest country in the world. But nowadays, we are 15th largest economy in, in the world during my lifetime. And when I was born, we are under the dictatorship. But now, we are enjoying the full democracy. It is because of the people's power and the people support our court and it is our role to protect the human rights and to protect the constitution itself. So the constitutional justice is so important. And with the support of the people, the role of the court is to persuade the people what is the constitution and what is the justice. So until now, I believe we are succeeding. So I want to share our experience with the other fellow countries. My this presentation is so short, but I try to make uh, these kinds of, uh, I'll try to make a paper to share our experience to uh, the world. Thank you for your kind cooperation. Thank you.
it was so happy with the presentation. She yes, didn't it just leave wants it. to keep. <laughs> yeah. So actually, while the slides are coming up, let me just say first yes. that um, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much to the organizing committee. This was a lot of organizing work. Uh, to Icon S for both existing and growing and being such a wonderful, supportive community. Um, and to the city of Hong Kong, which has really welcomed all of us here in this wonderful um, global city. So I want to say that first. Um, the second is that my co-panelists are talking about the rise and success of existing constitutional courts. And I'm afraid I have the opposite trajectory. So I'm going to be talking to you today about Hungary and Poland, which were two countries that until recently had really vibrant uh, and active constitutional courts. And a lot of my story today is going to be about how they were and are being killed off. Um, I should say that I have a lot of Hungarian and Polish friends and colleagues in the audience who are actually living through this now in their countries, and so I hope to do justice to their stories, but I hope that all of you at the conference um, who have a chance to talk to the representatives, the many representatives here from Hungary and Poland, uh, great, will have a chance to, uh, to meet and talk further about these developments. Um, I might also say, Ah, now you can hear me better. Um, I might also say that um, this is, I think, the conference with the most papers on Hungary and Poland that I think I've ever seen. And I wish it were a tribute to how well things are going, but I'm afraid, given my title, as you can see, it's not. Um, let me say one thing, is that I'm going to show you a lot of slides very quickly. Now, I do this as a teaching trick to keep my students from checking their email during class. Um, but if any of you want to see the slides at greater length, just let me know, because I'm going to go through things uh, really, really quickly. Oops, so let's see if this works. That doesn't work. OK. So, uh, so first, I'm going to be talking about the rise of populism in Europe. A number of us on different panels today have been talking about what populism is. I think one of the things we agree on is that we don't actually quite agree on what the idea of populism is. But the particular species of it that I'm going to be talking to you about today is a version that masquerades as majoritarianism, as in, I won an election, therefore I get to do whatever with any of the constitutional institutions that I inherited. And in the cases I'm going to be talking to you about today, this majoritarianism very quickly slides into autocracy. So the new European autocrats, and the two I'm going to be talking about are Viktor Orban here portrayed at left and Yaroslav Kaczynski portrayed here at right, um, have a similar trajectory. So both came to power in big elections, big elections in the sense that they won by larger majorities than any single party had won in any election since the end of the Cold War. In both cases, uh, they used their election victory to change the constitutional system and redesign constitutional institutions. Uh, in Hungary by law, in Poland a little bit by brute force. Um, they used these changes to create the superficial appearance of a constitutional democracy. And this is really crucial, especially for a group of constitutional experts like the ones we have at this conference. What's so interesting about the new autocrats is how much they care about keeping up the appearances of liberal constitutional democracy while gutting the contents of them. And so it's important to see through these superficial appearances and look to see at the systems that these people are creating underneath the surface, and that system is an autocracy. So constitutionalism itself has come under attack in this new form of populism, and, you know, and why is that? It's because constitutions constrain, and they particularly constrain executive power, and these new leaders that are coming to power resist all constraint on executive power. This is what they're doing, is undermining all that system of constraints. And so I'm going to put up, actually, the one good thing about Poland and Hungary is that it's improved political humor a lot. So I'm going to be showing you a number of cart. This is not a real picture, obviously. Um, this is Viktor Orban and uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski as Laurel and Hardy. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how these two systems um, came to be the way they are. And actually, literally, as we speak here today, there are events developing today, this week, um, that carry the story forward. So let me start with Hungary, start with the election in 2010, um, which was an election that, um, in which uh, Viktor Orban's Fidesz political party won pretty much fair and square, 53% of the vote. But under the election law that Hungary had at that time, 
this 53% of the vote was converted into 68% of the seats in the Hungarian parliament. In a system where a single two-thirds vote of the parliament could change anything in the constitution. So that election created essentially a government unbound by the constitution because it could change it at will, and it did. So in its first year in power, it amended the constitution that it inherited 12 times, and then a little bit under a year from their first election, um, they introduced a new constitution using the amendment rule of the old constitution. This constitution was sort of pulled out of a hat. Nobody saw it till it landed on the floor of the parliament. Even now, it's a bit unclear how it was drafted or by whom. There was a limited amount of parliamentary debate, after which it was passed with the votes of only this one party. It went into effect in January of 2012, and along with it came not just the Constitution, but something like 800 new laws that renovated the entire legal system of Hungary. Now, since this is a panel on judicial independence, I'm just going to concentrate on the, what this all did to the courts in Hungary. And most of you will know that, of course, the Hungarian Constitutional Court in the 1990s was one of the really powerful new constitutional voices in the post-communist landscape of Europe. That court had been very powerful, and that court had gotten very used to slapping down one government after another. All governments were, were not immune from this kind of treatment. Um, and it was clearly a campaign of the government of Viktor Orban when he first came to power that one of the most crucial things was to nullify the power of the constitutional court. So within a month of being elected, the first thing that was changed was the system for electing judges to the court. Under the old system, you needed a majority of parliamentary parties, followed by a two-thirds vote of the parliament, and Orban simply dropped the first stage, making it look just like the German constitutional court, in which, again, a judge can be elected with a single two-thirds vote of the parliament. What could be wrong with that? Hold on, of course. So they changed the selection process. Then they changed the number of judges. Now, following actually what uh, Mr. Erdogan did in Turkey, it wasn't so obviously a court packing move because what they did at the same time was to say, we're going to increase the competencies of the constitutional court. We're gonna give the court the power to hear constitutional complaints of the German sort for the first time, which was gonna massively increase the caseload of the court and in order to support the court, what does Fidesz do? It creates four new judgeships. And again, it was hard to say what was wrong with that picture because if you're going to increase the caseload, you should increase the number of judges. But of course, what happened was that Fidesz used this with their two-thirds majority in parliament. They could elect any judge without anyone telling them otherwise. And they put onto the court judges who were their own political loyalists. This is a fairly complicated slide, but what it shows you is the voting record of the early judges that they put onto the court. And a number of the, of the judges voted 100% with the government. And all but one of them voted overwhelmingly in favor of whatever the government wanted to do. And within three years, appointing judges like this, Fidesz had captured the constitutional court with its own appointments. That wasn't enough. So what they also did was they changed the procedure. So under the old Hungarian constitutional law, all the cases were essentially abstract review cases. Anyone could challenge a law in Hungary as, uh, you know, on the grounds that it was unconstitutional. Anyone, even if they didn't have a special interest in the matter. That jurisdiction was abolished and instead these constitutional complaints substituted. But it's extremely hard to get at the structural features of a constitutional order through the institution of constitutional complaints based only on rights claims. Because a lot of what was going on here was not a violation of individual rights easily said, but instead a renovation of the whole system. Along with this, because the court kept resisting until it was captured in 2013, there was, a, there was an amendment, because as soon as this new constitution was written, of course it had to be amended, because after all, they had the constitutional majority to do so. And so there was, a, there was an amendment, the fourth amendment to the constitution in 2013, that nullified the entire jurisprudence of the court from 1990 to 2011. So those of you who teach comparative constitutional law and still teach those cases, they're lovely cases, but they're no longer good law in Hungary, any of them. They abolished the entire jurisprudence. And then there had been a series of cases in which the Constitutional Court had struck down laws under the new Constitution for being unconstitutional. And that constitutional amendment inserted into the Constitution virtually all the laws that had been struck down as unconstitutional since. 
And then they said, and the court may not review constitutional amendments. So all of this meant the constitutional order was fixed and the constitutional court could say nothing about it. So after capturing the constitutional court, the government then moved on to the ordinary courts. And here they used a multi-pronged strategy as well. So the first thing was they created a new office called the National Judicial Office. And this office has the solo power to appoint judges or to name judges the president then nominally signs off. But these are all people from the same party because this woman, Tunde Hondo, is the single head of the National Judicial Office. And she alone has the power to hire, fire, reassign, promote, demote, and discipline all ordinary judges. And she's a very close friend of the prime minister and his wife, and she was the wife of the guy who drafted the new constitution. And she's a party loyalist. So essentially, all careers of judges in the ordinary courts are now in her hands. And along with that, the question was, well, how is she going to get the judgeships to fill? So Hungary lowered the judicial retirement age from 70 to 62 in a civil service judiciary, and that knocked out about a quarter of the Supreme Court and a majority of the court presidents, which immediately gave her some offices to fill. Now, the European Court of Justice actually found that the judicial retirement age was a violation of European law, but the European law on age discrimination. And so what's the, what's the remedy in an age discrimination case? It's compensating those who were discriminated against. So Hungary sort of paid all the judges to go away and kept all the judges under the new system and through this captured the ordinary courts. They had a special problem with the Supreme Court because this man, Andras Baca, had just returned from 17 years at the European Court of Human Rights where he had been the Hungarian judge and he had just been made the president of the Supreme Court of Hungary. He wasn't a friend of the ruling party. So how do they get rid of him? Because he was also too young to fire with the judicial retirement age. So they renamed the Supreme Court the Curia, the medieval name of the High Court of Hungary. And then they claimed it was a new institution in which all the judges of the Supreme Court had to reapply for their jobs. And then they put up a special qualification for the president of the court, that the president of the court had to have five years of judicial experience in Hungary. Andras Baca had three because he'd spent 17 years in Strasbourg. He was disqualified from being president. All the other judges got through, except that he was fired as president. He later won a case at the European Court of Human Rights. And one of the things you see at the European Court of Human Rights is that what the real problem here was, was judicial independence. But what right do you claim if you're a fired judge? What he won on the basis of was Article 10, freedom of expression because the court found that his criticism of the court reforms was what got him fired, and therefore the violation was a violation of his right to free speech. Again, think about how you frame judicial independence as a rights claim, either of an individual judge or of an individual litigant, a bit easier with the litigants, hard with the judges. And then this is the newest thing. So just last Thursday, there's another amendment, now the Seventh Amendment to the new Constitution. Um, and this, this amendment creates a new system of administrative courts. Because the Supreme Court is a little bit unreliable. This is Mr. Peter Darak, who's the president of the Supreme Court, handpicked by this government, but he turns out to be someone who's not completely reliable from their standpoint. So now they're going to take all the cases, all the administrative law cases, all the cases on permits for demonstrations, freedom of information cases, and a number of other politically sensitive cases. And they're going to turn them over to a new set of courts that will entirely bypass the ordinary courts altogether. Uh, in the earlier draft, and we don't know because this just passed the, the, um, the parliament last week, and we haven't seen a draft of the new administrative procedure, a new administrative uh, courts act. But under the earlier drafts that we were able to see, they weren't going to even require that these judges have any legal training. They were going to be civil servants, presumptively without life tenure. So watch this space. This is actually happening as we speak. And the justice minister a couple of weeks ago said, this is just the beginning of another overhaul of the judiciary. And finally, so Viktor Orban won his third election. The last, this one and the one in 2014 were not free and fair elections. No one else could have won except the governing party. So there's Mr. Orban being um, inaugurated for his third term on the 8th of May. And he gave an interview, again, last week, in which he said, in the autumn, we would like to launch a one to one and a half year long constitutional revision. So he's going to revise the Constitution again. And he's already appointed uh, Joseph Sire, the MEP who ran the last process, to do this. So watch the space. The judicial reform is not over. 
So let me turn to Poland and explain a little bit about what's happening there. What happened in Poland started a bit later. So Orban started in 2010. The Polish Constitutional Revolution started in 2015. And here again, there was a big election in which the Law and Justice Party, whose, Hung whose uh, Polish acronym is PiS, uh, won a majority of seats in the same in the lower house of parliament all by itself. So that was the first time that it happened in post-communist Poland. PiS also had won separately an election for the president of the country, and they also won a uh, control over the upper house. So it's a one-party government. Uh, they don't have a constitutional majority, but they have enough to pass any ordinary laws. Now, here too, the party uh, of, uh, and actually it's interesting, the head of this party is a guy called Yaroslav Kaczynski, who actually, as far as we know, is actually very, very ill. I mean, he hasn't been seen in public. He was hospitalized for a while. So we don't actually know there may be a very sudden change of circumstance in Poland. Um, he's the power behind the throne, but he's an ordinary MP. So he has no official state position. There's a separate prime minister, a separate president, but everyone knows that Kaczynski is sort of calling the shots. And the first thing he did, because they didn't have a constitutional majority, was to attack the constitutional court. So, uh, and this happened around judicial appointments. It turns out the outgoing government, seeing peace was coming in, overreached and elected some judges they weren't entitled to elect, along with the ones they were entitled to elect. Peace came in and didn't recognize any of the judges elected by the prior government and appointed all of their own. Um, and the president, affiliated with the peace party, swears in all the peace judges. The constitutional court then gives two rulings, one that finds that some of the civic platform judges were illegally elected, one saying some of the peace judges were illegally elected. The government refuses to publish either decision, and the constitutional court refuses to let in the judges who were illegally elected by either government. This leads to a kind of standoff. The parliament then passes a law that's designed to prevent the court from actually working without a special new quorum designed to hamstring the court until such time as the new judges that they elected could be seated. And basically all of this went on as in a standoff until the president of the Constitutional Court stepped down at the end of December 2016, at the end of his normal term. And at that point, a new interim president was elected. She was then elected actually president. She then seated all the judges legally and illegally elected by the governing party and then they assured everyone that everything is normal. But the, but the Constitutional Court no longer rules against the government. The ordinary courts in Poland have also come under attack. And last summer, some of you may have seen that the Polish parliament passed three laws. One captured the National Council on the Judiciary that makes judicial appointments. The other was designed to fire the entire Supreme Court, except those judges kept on at the discretion of the justice minister and to replace them with new ones. And the third was to fire all the court presidents throughout the ordinary court system and replace them as well. There were lots of demonstrations against this. There was lots of pressure on the president, Mr. Duda, to veto the laws. And actually, in the end, he vetoed two of the laws. He vetoed the law on the National Judiciary Council, which would have appointed judges, and he vetoed the law on the Supreme Court. Lots of people thought there was a victory, but he signed the third law. So at the discretion of the justice minister, for six months, he had the power to fire any court president in the country giving no reasons. Now he can fire presidents giving some reasons, but who's to get second guess what his reasons are? This is the veto. And lest you think that the government was going to stop there, they came back with new laws this spring. So there are new laws now that the Polish parliament has passed that allow the government to capture the National Council on the Judiciary. Those laws are passed. The new appointments are now just being made to that council. And um, judges are supposed to be on this council, but due to a, a call for a boycott out of po Poland's 10,000 judges, only 18 agreed to stand for election to this body. The rest are still challenging the government, which is interesting given how complicated this situation has been. But there's also this new law that passed that actually, um, yes, thank you, that actually um, allows the government to capture the Supreme Court. And how do they do that? Well, you've already heard the trick. They've lowered the judicial retirement age for judges on the Supreme Court. These, these ideas travel, right? From 70 to 65. That law takes effect next Tuesday, July 3rd, and that will give the government the power to fire 40% of the judges on the Supreme Court next Tuesday. 
So you may ask, where was the EU in all of this, right? Isn't the EU supposed to prevent this kind of stuff? And this is kind of about what the EU looks like right now. Uh, it's having a lot of fights. They very rarely agree on things. And that's part of the story about why the EU has been so ineffective. When the Hungarian stuff was going on, I think the EU, and particularly the European Commission, didn't really know what it was looking at. It didn't understand how serious this was. It didn't understand that these were permanent and structural changes. Um, and because everything was legal under Hungarian law, the Commission didn't see how it could actually enter the game and that figure out how to actually get the government of Hungary to change anything. And of course, at the same time, the Euro crisis was going on, the migration crisis happened, then Brexit was going on, and the European institutions, with the exception of the Parliament, I might add, which passed a number of very strong resolutions against Hungary, which were symbolically important, but had no real sanctioning effect, all of this meant that the European institutions sort of let this thing happen without really being able to intervene. They claimed they didn't have the power. Just before that commission, the, the commission that was there until 2014, just before they left office, Vice President Viviana Redding proposed this new rule of law framework. Because it turns out in the European treaties, there's a mechanism for sanctioning countries that no longer follow the values of the EU. It's called Article 7 of the Treaty of the European Union. And it's a long, complicated, super majoritarian, in one place, unanimous process before anything can happen. And the European institutions had been reluctant to invoke it because they didn't have sort of a, an entrance ramp to the process. And so they passed this thing. It's, I won't even read it to you. You can see it's like very long. And it's lots of stages of, you know, warning, consulting, the cajoling, whatever. And so this was passed, you'd think, for Hungary. But then there was an election. Everybody forgot about it. And then Poland happened. So by the time Poland came along, there was already this mechanism designed to engage the commission in a conversation with the country over their backsliding from European values. And actually, very quickly, a few months into the Polish government's term, the EU now, you know, launched this rule of law framework to start this conversation with Poland over its, um, its compliance with the rule of law. Two years passed, lots of dialogue, lots of angry words. Poland kept sticking its thumb in the eye of everybody who would show up to criticize them. And finally, at the last December, after two years of this, it, while in the meantime, I might add, of course, the consolidation of power over the courts is going on, Finally, the European Commission says, we're going to start this so-called Article 7 process. We've written a reasoned opinion to the European Council. We therefore propose that they start this process of sanctioning Poland. So what's happened? Well, so far, the Council has done nothing until today. So literally, as we're here, <laughs> there's a hearing today in the General Affairs Council of the European Union to look at this question. And the reason why they're having it today is because a week from today, 40% of the judges of the Supreme Court of Poland are going to be or could be fired, right? And so what the EU can do in a week, we don't actually know, but they're actually meeting today. And what do we expect? Well, you know, one thing we know is that, is that the European uh, authorities are very divided on this question, and you need unanimity before any real sanctions can, can prevail. And so there's a lot of smoke and noise at the European Union, but so far nothing that really stops this process of governmental control over the judiciary. And so what is left of judicial independence? Well, this is a cartoon that shows, you know, President Duda with a bloody sword with the head of justice bleeding over his head, and a picture that shows just Viktor Orban as all the judges on the Constitutional Court of Hungary. So what is left? Well, so here's a problem. All of us in this room should know more than we do about judicial independence. One of the problems with judicial independence is that we know what it is in some very, very abstract sense, but we don't know what it is in any very concrete sense. So what do I mean by that? So what methods for judges, appointing judges, does guarantee their independence? Do you appoint them through a council of judges, through a justice ministry, through a process of executive nomination and parliamentary confirmation? There's lots of different procedures, many of which re result in independent judiciaries, but some of those can also be captured, right? It really depends on what the political system is you're in. What about the justice ministry in the courts? One thing Poland is now saying, because it's proposing to have the justice minister have a much bigger role 
in the, in the selection of judges is Poland says, well, that's what Germany does. The justice ministry runs the process for selecting ordinary judges, and that should be good enough. The Hungarians said in response to the constitutional court judges, uh, the change in the procedure for electing constitutional court judges, we now have exactly the same procedure as Germany. And here's the problem. It turns out that, I'm going to, the autocrats know more than we do, <laughs> which is to say a lot of the people designing these systems are really good comparative lawyers. And they've looked around and they've canvassed what are the alternatives for appointing judges? What are the alternatives for firing judges? For impeaching them? For limiting their terms? Do they have a retirement age? Is that retirement age fixed? All those kinds of questions. And they've looked around and they've realized what very many different systems do. And what they do is they pick the thing from some other good system that is toxic when applied to them at home. And the problem is that that kind of borrowing disables a lot of the critics who say, well, gee, I don't really know how this works in Germany, but if they say the justice minister appoints all the judges, what could be wrong with that? Right? And so this is where I think our own expertise really needs to get much better because so far we haven't been as good at keeping up with this kind of use, strategic use of comparative examples as the autocrats have been at using them. And so what we need to think about are these systemic violations of the rule of law. To look not just at appointment procedures for judges or at their jurisdictional rules, but to think of the whole thing as kind of a system. And to assess when a new government comes into place, is their judicial reform fixing an actual problem by making judges more independent? Or are the changes actually capturing judiciaries that have been captured themselves. I mean, or they're, they're capturing judiciaries so that they're under political guidance. Okay, we've seen the EU is hopeless, and so I'll end on a positive note. And that is that the European Court of Justice has not missed any of this. And what we're now seeing is that the European Court of Justice is kind of coming to the rescue, or maybe it comes to the rescue. And so they had a case uh, in the spring that grew out of Portugal on whether austerity measures could result in the lowering of judicial salaries. And they said, yes, as long as the austerity measures come from the EU. But they actually said that every member state of the EU is obligated to have an independent judiciary. And then they went on to explain in some detail about what that would look like. Immediately, a judge in Ireland that has, a, has an extradition warrant, a European arrest warrant, for a Pole who is supposed to be sent back for trial in Warsaw, immediately this Irish judge says, wow, I've seen what the commission just said about judicial independence in Poland, and it looks to me like the, the judge, judges there are not independent. So she writes a reference to the court of justice and says, hmm, tell us, are the judges there independent enough for us to send someone back? The uh, Advocate General's opinion in the Selmar case is supposed to be issued as we're sitting here, so we can all go check after this session and we'll see. But the European Court of Justice has now shown itself to be potentially now involved in this matter. The question is whether that's enough after the courts have been captured. And so I'll just end by saying, you know, a lot of us, I think as experts, have been way too complacent about the independence of the judiciary. And if I can say to my American colleagues here that one of the ways we've contributed is by going on and on about the counter-majoritarian difficulty, setting up courts as if they are counter to the operation of democratic societies. And so if you think it's hard to run a democracy with an active judiciary, try running a democracy without one. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to have this opportunity to brief you some aspects of the Taiwan Constitutional Court and Taiwan democracy. As some of you may er already know that on May 24 last year, the Taiwan Constitutional Court, the TCC, rendered the landmark census marriage case. In this ruling, the TCC declared the concurrent provisions of the civil court that got, uh, governed the marriage institution unconstitutional for restricting 
uh, marriage to opposite sex uh, couples in violation of freedom of marriage and equal protection of laws. As widely reported, the same-sex marriage case marks how far Taiwan has moved away from a traditional patriarchal uh, Confucian society under a quasi-military dictatorship to one of the most tolerant liberal countries in the world over the past three decades. Put even more broadly, the court seems to set a social uh, revolution emotion, emotion without much ink uh, spirit. Bringing Taiwan into uh, line with Australia, Brazil, Mexico, South uh, Africa, and the United States, among others, where same-sex marriage is legally recognized through uh, judicial ruling, the same-sex marriage case testifies to the TCC's relentless judicial activism. Yet. Just as Taiwan path toward liberal democracy is anything but smooth, so the TCC journey to becoming an activist court is winding and full of challenges. The TCC initially styled as a Council of Grand Justice was inaugurated in 1948 and will soon be celebrate its 70th birthday this uh, September. The Council of Grand Justice was organized under the Constitution of the Republic of China, which was in act and promulgated on December 25, 1946, and put into effect on December uh, 25, uh, 1947. Aside from uh, its uh, establishment of different government structure, the ROC Constitution share much similarity with other modern democratic constitutions. That is, it was completely in accordance with modern constitutionalism. The Council of Green Justice was designed to have judicial review function to ensure the constitutionality of all government actions, effectively uh, protecting individuals from unconstitutional government intrusion. Another point to note uh, is that the justice, of the, cons uh, uh, the justice may come from multiple of uh, backgrounds, including career judges, high-level officials, legislators, and academics. We would never know whether the ROC Constitution would successfully assist China democratic government smoothly. For after December 1949, Taiwan and uh, the associate IRAs have been the only territories ruled by the ROC government under the Nationalist Party, also known as KMT, after its defeat in Chinese civil war. Yet, when the ROC government reconstituted itself in Taiwan, it continued the rule of the temporary provisions effective during uh, the period of national mobilization for separation of the Communist Rebellion, which was announced in 1948, and martial law rule which was imposed under the Declaration of a State of Emergency in 1949. Under the temporary provisions and the martial law rule, constitutionally protected uh, rights were severely restricted, and the nationwide uh, relations for nation, national uh, representatives were interrupt, whereby seizing uh, old democratic function. KMT, first led by Jiang Kai-she, then his son Jiang, Jiang Jingguo, used wartime legal institutions 
to support its authoritarian rule on Taiwan till 1987. Under decades-long uh, martial law rule, the role of the TCC was sub substantially limited, to say the least. The core early case law was mostly concerned with the run of the mill issues about the conflicting interpretation between government departments or ordinary courts. With respect to uh, constitutional decisions during that period, the court was anything but an activist uh, constitutional player. The court was more of a convenient problem solver for the political branch when the latter sought constitutional cover for its political needs than an in independent guardian of the constitutional order. In its worst scenario, the TCC was criticized for being an instrument of the authoritarian regime. True constitutional rule became possible after the lift of martial law rule in 1987, particularly after the government retracted its declaration of an emergency state in 1991 Free from the straitjack of the martial law rule, the TCC began to flex its muscle. With the assistance of the TCC, which had redeemed itself through its bootstrapping rulings, no more constitutional democracy was restored. Constitutional function to protect individual rights has amazingly uh, increase since then. Following the TCC transformation into uh, institutional facilitators uh, of Taiwan's uh, democratic transition, judicial activism has been the characteristic of its uh, intervention in constitutional re-engineering. One example is the constitutional amendment case of year 2000, which invoked the basic, the basic structural doctrine to strike down the constitutional amendment of 1999, which had been jointly supported by both the ruling KMT and the main opposition party, DPP. Another example is the TCC gradual dismantling of the spatial power relations by extending, extending judicial remedies to legal relations previously within the internal uh, administration of civil services, uh, the, the military, school, and the prisons. Also, thanks to the TCC activist ruling, the prosecution of the criminal libel is limited to those with uh, Actual malice. Privacy is recognized as one of the unenumerated constitutional rights. Women are no longer subordinate to their spouse, but equal partners in the marriage. Speeches in support of communism or secessionism or pro Taiwan independence are given the same protection as advocacy of democracy. This period also witnessed the TCC building a reach of jurisprudence on some constitutional doctrines principles, most notably uh, the principle of pr proportionality. Taken together, the TCC has uh, transformed itself from a convenient problem solver for the political branch of the KMT-dominated party state into a reliable ally of progressive reformers. Judicial activism is not inimical to constitutional democracy in Taiwan. Instead, the new birth of judicial review and the constitutional freedom is a result of the 
called activist intervention in Taiwan transition to democracy. The foregoing suggests that judicial activism has been an, a characteristics of the court since its uh, transformation into uh, the guardian of the constitutional order. Nevertheless, it gives only one side of the TCC, in TCC role in Taiwan passed uh, toward demo constitutional democracy. On the flip side, the court has been more of a willing follower of the democratic zeitgeist uh, than a trailblazer in Taiwan's changing political uh, landscape. Examples include cases involving death penalty and co-order pu public apology as remedy in civil tort of defamation. However, the TCC did swim against the tide and issues and issued rulings that upheld principle of civil rights and liberties despite their contentious character, braving the possibility of angry public reaction. The court terminated the public prosecutor's unilateral power to decide pre-trial detention on grounds of due process and invalidated the the statutory provision for giving uh, massage uh, license to the visually impaired alone on the basis of the principle of equal protection, proportionality, and the freedom of occupation. Furthermore, it paved the way for limited legalization of prostitution by condemning uh, the discriminatory infliction of administrative penalties on prostitutes without punishing the crimes. Taken together, the court seems to be partly uh, the institution messenger of public feeling and partly the defender of constitutional principle in the post partial law uh, era. It should be noted that the success of the TCC has pivoted on certain political preconditions. Only if politicians and the people take different stances on constitutional issues are prepared to submit to the court's ruling, can it be an effective a guardian of the constitutional democracy. Yet, the hyper-partisan uh, rivalry after Taiwan's first uh, party turnover in two, year 2000 threw the effectiveness of the TCC into doubt indeed. Although the court remained an activist and continued to intervene in contentious separation of powers issues, such as the administration's controversial unilateral decision to discontinue the construction of nuclear power uh, plant. Its ruling in this regard will not always fully comply with. The question of the TCC effect, effectiveness and even relevance became more evident uh, when Taiwan saw its second party turnover in year 2008. As the KMT retook the presidency and continued to control the Congress, the TCC retreated from judicial activism. Although the TCC has gradually returned to the track of judicial activism with the, uh, the appointment of seven justices by the new government in year 2016. The reactions in the wake of the same-sex marriage case spoke to the challenges facing the TCC after Taiwan's uh, authoritarian uh, democratizations. Welcomed by uh, 
LGBTQI activists, and human rights advocates. The TCC decree that where the Congress should fail to legislate for same-sex marriage within the two-year remedial grace period, the current civil court would then be extended to same-sex couple who wish to enter into marriage. Yet, the same-sex marriage case only elicited the public's fierce reaction, and the political branches lackluster response. As of now, the discriminatory civil court remains unchanged. Moreover, the social forces that are opposed to census uh, marriage uh, are pushing for a referendum and at chipping away at the TCC ruling. Granted, the TCC received disapproving public reaction before, yet the census marriage case is the first case in the area of human rights that raised strong doubt uh, about the TCC's legitimate, legitimate role in balancing constitutional rights against traditional values and the religious beliefs. After democratization, authoritarianism, authoritarianism and political violence are no longer the major concern in Taiwan pursuit of constitutional democracy. As the values become increasingly diverse and uh, the minimum consensus uh, dissipate, dissipates in the post-authoritarian uh, Taiwan, the TCC is at crossroads. The story about the TCC journey to becoming an activist court is one of the judicial bootstrapping Without its bootstrapping exercise, the old court would most likely have been met defunct uh, together with the ROC old regime. Yet, bootstrapping is not, no guarantee of success. The TCC story further suggests that the success of judicial review is conditioned by the minimal consensus necessary for the effectiveness of judicial decision or rulings. As noted in the beginning, the census marriage case testifies to Taiwan's evolution into a tolerant and a diverse society. Just as all constitutional court in liberal democracies are hard pressed to find legitimacy on the basis of social wide consensus. So the TCC authority is no longer beyond question when Taiwan moved from an anti-communist bastion to an open society. After democratization, the TCC is at the crossroads of the rebuilding its own legitimacy amid tensions between popular feelings and constitutional principles. The story will never end, though, as long as the TCC keep reinventing itself. That's come to my report. Thank you for your patience. Because we started a bit late, I've been authorized to extend the session by about 10 minutes or so for some comments from the audience. And we have assistance with microphones, so please identify yourselves by raising your hand, and we'll happily bring a microphone to you. I see someone over here. Do we have a microphone over here, please? For Professor Wen Chen Cheng. Microphone down here, please. Thank you very much. And while we're waiting, another one over here, please. Thank you very much. Okay, your name, is, please, and who are, you, who are you addressing your question to? 
This is Wen Chen from Taiwan. I would like really to pose this question to all panelists. So we are now hearing uh, two very different stories. Uh, one, on the one side from Korea and Taiwan, we see uh, the courts uh, keeping a good face, uh, defending constitutionalism. And I'm wondering uh, from Justice Kang and also Professor Lin, who also served in the constitutional court between 2003 and 2011. And so what are the strategies uh, for you when you serve in the court to resist populist attack on the courts in the judicial assertion of activism? And what are the particular strategies for you in your country, uh, in the courts, in the justice's mind, to uh, assert your judicial independence? The other thing I want to also uh, pose to uh, Kim uh, is that, so how do you see Taiwanese and Korean stories? Is the pre-play uh, of what's going on in uh, Poland and Hungary, uh, and then we are just going to be worried about what uh, to happen next in Taiwan and South Korea, or are there divergent paths you see somehow uh, that is taking place on the one side in Korea and Taiwan, and on the other side in East European countries where, you know, uh, 30 years ago, uh, we celebrated these three jurisdictions, you know, uh, East Asia and East European countries as the kind of paradigmic model of post-communist uh, uh, transitions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. Let me collect two more questions and then we'll go to the panel. So if there's a third hand, please raise your hand and we'll come to you. Number two here. Number three there. Please. I'm, num I'm number two. My name is Robert Grzeszczak. I come from Poland. So actually, it's not a question. It's a short statement. Uh, Professor Szepela, thank you for your support and for the great presentation. It's very sad, but it's true. And um, I would say that participation of other actors in procedures of protection, protect of rule of law, uh, such Council of Europe, such European Union, even European Union, is very limited. And, and my, uh, my, uh, in, my po in my point of view, only Polish citizens during the parliamentary election can change it. And I hope we, we do it. Because it's the only one way to, to do something with our situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our third question before we go to the panel, please. Um, my question is for Professor Shefley. Uh, thank you for a um, very interesting uh, talk. I was struck by how easy it seemed uh, to, uh, to hamper, to undermine these, these previously quite uh, sort of vibrant judiciaries. And I was wondering if they shared structural weaknesses and you know, were there issues looking back with hindsight in the sort of post-Cold War uh, democratization, the, the sort of stru structural issues with how the newly democratized uh, judiciaries were, were constructed, what sorts of powers they had or they lacked. Let's go in order of the speakers. Professor Judge Kang, please, and then Professor Kim Shepley, and then Professor Ling. Thank you for the question. I'll make it very brief. Our strategy is to keep the principle as I said, in Korea, we have 40 years of experience of judicial, uh, the operation of the government to the, to the judiciary. During the time, people realized the importance of the independent the judiciary. Also, we are handling very hot issues in Korea. So, always, about half of people support our decision, about half uh, dislike our decision. Once we are not follow the principles, then we cannot survive. But we, we follow the principles, so the people who are, who are opposing our decision, they know one, at the next, next time, court will support their opinion. So it is very important to keep the principle and, so, and persuade the people. The, the, so the interrelations between courts and the people is very important. And also, in, in the sense, we must persuade the people with the decisions of other courts. So in the sense, the cooperation with the, the international court and also the international association on 
for example, the Hu European Court of Human Rights and European Court, the UN Convention on something like that, because people realize that the, even Koreans, we are only one separated countries in the world, but we, we realize that the, all peoples are same. So even we are, we are under the threat of a nuclear threat from the North Korea, but South Korean people has a right to enjoy the same level of human rights with our neighbor countries. So it is very important to keep the principle and the, make the people know the, what the world is saying about the human right. Thank you. Great. Let's see. This is on. There. Okay. Can you hear? No. Yes. Yeah? No. Okay. Sorry. There. There. Okay. Um, yeah, so there, two of the questions actually dealt with the question of the uniqueness of the Hungarian and Polish cases. And of course, the Pol Hungarian and Polish cases are copying from each other. And like I mentioned, you know, Viktor Orban borrowed at least some of his strategies from Mr. Erdogan in Turkey. So one thing we're seeing is that this is actually a set of techniques that are traveling. So we need to be kind of on the alert <coughs> to me. But the other thing is that I think this is really not unique to new democracies. I think this is something that can happen anywhere. Um, in fact, one of the things I wonder as an American is how much of this is happening in the U.S. So, for example, if we look at judicial appointments in the United States since President Trump um, came to power, he now has, you know, uh, a, enough votes in the Senate to get through a lot of pretty radical judges. And so, and this has been one of the main things that, that he's accomplished. And so we haven't yet seen the effect of all these new judges on the system. So I think it's really, it's, it comforts many of us to think this only happens in new democracies, but I think these are really techniques um, that can spread from place to place. If I can also say something, just especially to this group, that one of the things that's happening to cover this up is what I think of as comparative law obfuscation, right? So how many countries really teach comparative law seriously? Not so many. And so what happens is these new autocrats come along and they say, we're taking something from Germany, we're taking something from France, we're taking something from some obviously good democracy. And what could be wrong with it? And this kind of disables domestic criticism in ways that make it extremely hard for ordinary citizens or even ordinary lawyers who only know their own legal system to challenge. And so this is why I think a lot of us have an obligation now to think about how we teach constitutional law, how we teach comparative law about the centrality of comparative law so that it's not only the autocrats who know how these different systems are structured, they take one rule out of context and drop it down in their own system, and the rest of us know that systems operate as systems. So a lot of this is a failure of education that I think a lot of us have some obligation to try to overcome. Uh, <clears throat> I fully agree with uh, Justice Khan's uh, experience. Being a justice of the court uh, should uh, keep and uh, concentrate and, and should follow the principle. And also, you have to keep your own independence, no matter what uh, this outside pressure. When I was in the court, I believe to, if, if you want to, uh, to convince the, the people, then first you have to have uh, your own, I mean, the court should be, uh, have a consensus in the, in the court. So it's, uh, if the court is split, and then uh, you, you, you will lose your legitimacy, and you will lose your power of to convince. And also, when we deal with uh, the hard issues, there's a different kind of voices or different kind of views or opinions. And I will say we should open the, we, we should give the, we should open the court to different kind of voices and different kind of view uh, into the court. Use court as a platform uh, for uh, rational debate and uh, exchange uh, uh, opinion. No matter what the de decision the court rendered because you already opened the door and people know what's going on. 
what's the opinion the, from different view and different side. So people will judge whether or not your, your decision is rational or not. So this is uh, my own experience. Thank you. I saw many more hands up than time permits. And I think panelists, you can take that as a compliment. It's a mark of a very excellent panel. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their remarks and their reflections. This concludes the second plenary panel. I invite you to come and meet the panelists if you haven't yet done so and enjoy the next concurrent session of panels. Thank you.